I'm going to start the recording, recording now. So we're recording, we're going. Uh, slide should be back up. And okay. All right. So if you uh, have a question while I'm lecturing, you want to stop me, you can send a message via the chat. I will keep a, an eye on that. And uh, or you could use kind of the raise hand feature in Zoom. That's actually quite nice because it's really obnoxious and it gives me a little pop up window in the middle of my screen so I can't miss it. So if you want to try that to get my attention, if I miss your chat message, feel free to go ahead. All right, so today, uh, if you guys watch the, uh, can you guys give me a, uh, so I sent around a video uh, through email yesterday. Did you guys get a chance to watch that? Uh, a message in chat would be, uh, would be good if you uh, watched it or you could raise your, do the raise hand feature. All right, well, uh, I'm sure that, uh, all right, cool, people. It seems like it did make the rounds. So a lot of that video is probably, I don't know how much of that stuff you guys know and don't know. Uh, I'm assuming you, you probably talked about the cell at some point if you're a biology major. Uh, so what we're going to do today is from a physics perspective, we're going to start trying to talk about electrical forces in terms of energy. Uh, but the main goal here is by doing so, it's going to allow us to talk about, uh, figure out where some of the language that we use in other contexts outside of physics regarding charges and uh, electrical forces comes from and gives us an idea of uh, some of the terms you might have heard in other places. Uh, in particular terms like potential and what is meant by like a uh, membrane resting potential and later on like uh, an action potential in a neuron. So that's kind of where we're going with this. Uh, but I'll start with the physics and then we'll get into uh, kind of the biology bits as we get to the problems. So uh, what is the uh, idea here? So if we go back to the idea of conservation of energy, at least where we left off last semester, we had the idea that, of course, that energy can change form, but it can't be created or destroyed. That means mathematically, if we add up the total change in energy in any system, that whether that's a ball rolling down a hill or a, a cell of some sort, et cetera, et cetera, Uh, that change in energy has to be zero unless we're adding energy into the system from the outside. And that's what we call work. So if uh, you guys can see the laser pointer here, I figured out that this was an option in PowerPoint, which is cool. So all of our changes of energy, whether it be kinetic, gravitational, energy stored in a spring, energy stored in chemical bonds, uh, or thermal energy of microscopic motion, all those changes equal to zero unless we're doing work on the system from the outside or we're adding heat into the system in a chemical sense, but that would be kind of something added over here as well. Now what we're going to do is, we're gonna say the electrostatic force, very much like gravity, also can be thought of in terms of storing energy. So we can extend the law of conservation of energy to include a potential energy due to static electricity, which we're adding here in red. So this is called the electrical potential energy. And uh, that's what we're kind of going to be uh, talking about and thinking about today. So just to see how the electrical force can store energy, uh, Let's think about like moving a charge around and uh, thinking about what it would do. 
So we could take this situation here where we have our capacitor plates from our last lecture. So plates of all this charge that's stuck and they create a big electric field in the center. So similar to like one of your problems that you had uh, over the past uh, day, there was one problem where you had a loose charge inside the capacitor and it kind of felt uh, it was free to move. So here we have another situation like that where we have this loose charge in the center and it's a positive one, so it wants to be attracted to this negative plate. Well, we can imagine now bringing a hand in and pushing the charge towards the positive plate. And if you think about it, it's kind of like we get a spring effect. So if we kind of push in the charge here with this little animation, push, push this small positive charge close to the negative, close to the other positive charge, it has all this energy stored. It's like we're compressing an invisible spring. And if we let it go, it flies away. So this is basically the main idea about how the electrical force can store energy. If you move a charge in such a way that it wants to repel and then it has a lot of potential energy. And then if you release it, the electric field will accelerate the charge and all that stored potential energy converts to kinetic energy. So the first place we wanna start if we wanna get, for instance, a formula for potential energy for the electric force is to realize that all the work we do pushing this charge closer to that positive plate is going to be equal, all that work we do is stored as potential energy. So the work is for force times distance, so the force which, with which we push times the distance we push it, that would be delta x here. All of that work is gonna be stored as potential energy. So we can go through a little bit like kind of a short analysis here to get a formula for the uh, potential energy for the electric force. This next slide is gonna be one of those ones where you really only have to copy down the final formula in red, circled in red if you, if you don't wanna copy down the rest. But just kind of showing you how we get this formula here. And of course, feel free to stop me at any point if you have questions. So, just kind of giving myself some room here. The, uh, so let's start with this idea that the electric force, or the, the work, the force of the hand pushing this charge a distance stores energy as electrical potential energy. We're gonna make an assumption that we push the charge slowly so that we're not actually speeding it up. So that means that means all of the energy we're given the charge is going into potential energy and not kinetic energy. From a force standpoint, what that means is that the acceleration is zero. So if we sum up the forces, we're gonna have the force of our hand pushing and the electric force pushing in the opposite direction, they're going to be equal to zero. So this means the force that our hand pushes in this little experiment is gonna be equal to the electrical force, which we know from a few weeks back is the charge that we're moving times the electric field. So kind of plugging this in here, our formula for the electrical potential energy is the charge that's moving times the field is moving through times the distance over which it moves. So if we push that charge a distance delta x, and we know the charge in the electric field it's in, the amount of potential energy we store is equal to charge times electric field times that distance we push it. Uh, if you kind of make, this kind of makes sense in terms of what it looks like if you compare it to the gravitational potential energy formula, we had a, a similar effect there. If we lift an object a distance delta y off the ground, the potential energy we store is mass times the gravitational field times the distance we move. So it's a kind of a nice analog there. Any questions so far at this point? All right, if not, then this formula here is one of our go-tos for this class. So put a star next to it or remember where it's going to be. 
This is our way we compute electrical potential energy. The main tricky thing with electrical potential energy is that this charge here, this is not an absolute value. The sign of the charge matters here. And that's because, of course, if we had a negative charge here, in order to store potential energy, we would have to push it in the reverse direction. It would want to repel from the negative plate. So this adds a, kind of a, a tricky thing to uh, the idea of electrical potential energy in that positive charges will have really high electrical potential energy uh, when negative charges have low stored potential energy and vice versa. So if you want to think about it in terms of gravity, it's like the charge is like, it's like we're pushing this positive charge uphill as we push it towards the positive plate. And then if we let it go, it rolls downhill and all that stored energy converts to kinetic energy. But for the negative charge, the direction of uphill versus downhill is reversed. So uphill is this way going down towards the negative plate. And when we release it, the charge will speed up and gain kinetic energy as it moves towards the positive plate. So whether we gain or lose potential energy, whether delta U is positive or negative, depends on the sign of the charge. So in this formula, the sign of the charge is important. So often we don't know the uh, signs of the charge or the amount of charge that we're moving. Uh, this might be the case if we're working with a wire or a, uh, a like charges in a wire or ions moving around in a liquid. Yeah, except when we're talking about these like cartoon situations, we don't really know how much charge we have moving. So often, instead of talking about just the potential energy, we really talk about this ratio, the ratio of potential energy divided by charge. Because usually we can know the electric field and we know a distance over which our charge is moving. We know how long a wire is, or we know the distance between these two plates. So this ratio we can compute. It's often the more useful thing to talk about in terms of potential energy for electric forces. And it's given a special name, uh, it actually is two, depending on who you're talking to. So this ratio here is written as delta V. And if you're talking to an electrical engineer, that is called a voltage. It's proportional to the potential energy. However, another term, and a term you're probably, uh, if you're a biologist, you're more aware of is this ratio delta V is often called not a potential energy, but a potential difference. So if we like separate a lot of charges on the different sides of a uh, cell membrane or in different sides of a capacitor plate, we use, we need to store potential energy to do that. So when we have this separation of charge, we say we have kind of a potential difference, and this leads to the term membrane potential or resting potential or action potential in a nerve cell. And we'll come back to those terms later. But the main idea is that this, this quantity delta V is just proportional to the potential energy that you have stored. If you happen to know the amount of charge you have, you can multiply del delta V by Q to get the actual potential energy. Uh, and sometimes you can do that. The reason why we deal with delta V is because we have meters that can measure it directly. It's a lot easier to measure than the actual uh, full potential energy delta U. I know this is generally like very can the difference in the kind of relation between these two things is often a very very confusing thing so i i know i'm probably doing it doing this lecture online is not going to help things very much uh but 
the reason we need this is really to define some terms and because delta v is often what we work with from here on out but if you remember that delta v is proportional to your change in potential energy that's the main idea so let's talk about some units and just some properties so the units in si units for voltage are uh, it's uh, energy divided by charge by definition so it's joules per coulomb and that's given a special name called the volt also doesn't help that the symbol for the quantity and the symbol for the unit are exactly the same but uh so one volt again just is a measure of it's a different it's a measure of potential energy just used only in the context of electricity and electric forces and this is often our voltage our delta v is often something we can measure so in a case where we do know the charge we can get our total change in potential energy just by multiplying delta v by the charge that's kind of why this is useful so as kind of an idea here everyone's probably seen a battery at some point and knows the different like voltage ratings on the batteries so you have batteries that are normal kind of small cylindrical batteries double a batteries they're 1.5 volt batteries these kind of two prong square batteries are nine volt batteries so what that means is that if you kind of connect a wire to this battery and let charge move from one end to another uh, this is a measure of how much potential energy the charges gain or lose moving from one end to the other the other thing that's useful about voltage is that since we can measure it directly with meter with uh with meters that we have we can if we can get the voltage and we know the difference in voltage between two points if we know how far away those are that allows us to get a quick measure of the electric field between those two points and this formula here just comes from i'll come back to this slide in one second so if we go here to the definition of voltage uh, and we just isolate e so divide by the distance our charges move then we get this formula so and i think uh this is the last uh these two then are the last two new kind of mathematical formulas for today uh, so i have a uh slide that uh kind of just animates this idea which i could show you in a second are there are there any questions in this point okay so let's try to uh let's just try to visualize this a, a bit uh before we jump into a problem so I'm going to take this car battery here. Car batteries are often 12 volts. So what that means is that we have these two different leads on the battery, right? And one of them will have what we say is a higher voltage than the other, but they have to be, the difference delta V between them has to be 12. And we could kind of set our origin, if you will, such that we'll call this one to be at a potential energy of zero and then the positive lead here will be at a higher potential energy and that's what's represented by the higher voltage so what this means is that if we take let's now take an idea and connect these two with a wire and don't do this by the way this is a very 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 bad idea to do with a car battery 
but let's imagine connecting these two with a wire. And what these numbers mean is that if we had a one Coulomb charge here, that this 12 volts means that this charge has 12 joules of kinetic energy at this, of potential energy at this point. And then it's going to, it's going to want to move to the position of lower potential energy. So it's going to lose that potential energy and gain kinetic energy and move as current through the wire to the negative terminal. So just like it's roll, a ball rolling downhill. However, if we had two joules or a two Coulomb charge, what this number means is that if we want the total potential energy, we'd have to multiply this voltage by two coulombs to get 24 joules of potential energy. So this bigger charge will gain, will move also roll downhill, but it's going to be accelerated, repelled even more strongly by this positive end of the battery. And thus it's going to accelerate more and gain more kinetic energy by the end. So it'll really kind of move quickly through the wire. The last and the thing that always makes this confusing and makes everything about electric forces confusing is that negative charges, the direction of downhill, if you will, is different. So a negative charge, say of minus one coulombs that starts here, at this terminal, if we multiply the voltage value by the charge, it's going to have zero joules of potential energy. And at the positive terminal, it will have minus 12 joules of potential energy. So that means the direction downhill, the direction towards lower energy for the negative charge is in the reverse direction. So that's why the sign of the charge is important here. And also why working with voltage instead of potential energy is more useful because it's the same for all kinds of charge. The potential energy and what's high versus low potential energy changes with different types of charge. So all charges move from high energy to low energy positions, but if we work in terms of voltage, positive charges move from high voltage points to low, negative charges will move from low voltage points to high voltage. Anyway, and if you're like, I suggest reading the, uh, we're, what we're doing here is a chapter, the beginning of, I believe, is chapter 21. So we're covering chapters 21.1 to 21.3 today. Uh, so that will uh, that will kind of help a lot if you want a kind of different ways to look at this same idea. But this is the way I think it's uh, kind of best to look at it. So if there aren't uh, if there aren't any questions at this point, I think it it'll help working through some problems. So I got I've got two for you. Uh, one is uh, kind of building on our our understanding of cell membranes and cell walls and the electrical energy there. And then the other is more of a engineering application. So any questions before we kind of go in and try to look at these problems? Okay, good. So our first problem will be about uh, a cell. So as a reminder, before we get into it, you might want to write down some of these other uh, some of these other formulas. So basically what we're going to need today, we're not going to have any springs in the problem, so we don't need spring potential energy. Uh, so we don't really need that one. We're not really going to have any gravitational problems, so we're not going to need that potential energy. What we will need, though, are kinetic energy formula and our, I left out the deltas here, but uh, our new potential energy formula in terms of voltage for, uh, for electrical potential energy. So really, 
putting this stuff together, our main relation for these next two problems is going to be a change in kinetic energy. The kinetic energy will be equal to change in kinetic energy will be caused by a change in electrical potential energy. So uh, this will kind of be a starting point for a lot of our problems. And as a reminder, if delta k is positive, that means the part, the moving object has sped up because k is proportional to velocity squared. If delta k goes down, it means our moving object, whatever it is, slows down. Okay, so setting up our next problem. Uh, the main reason we're kind of going through all this terminology and learning how to talk about this uh, same electrical force problem, but in terms of energy and voltage instead of electric field is because it aligns more with the way uh, scientists talk about this problem in, for instance, the context of a cell. So as a reminder, and if you guys kind of watched the video, the basic idea of what's happening in a cell membrane is that you have this ion separation. So generally you have diffusion, which means that particles want, ions want to move from high concentration to low concentration. But we also have these things called uh, ion pumps in the cell that end up trying to counteract that diffusion. And the main idea is that it keeps uh, uh, sodium and potassium ions separated. So you have more sodium ions outside the cell, more potassium ions inside the cell. Uh, and that leads to a net charge difference. But as we kind of talked about, you could think of the sodium and potassium pumps in the cell as acting kind of like that hand pushing the charges across the capacitor plate. So as we move these charges across the cell membrane, we're kind of, this is going to take energy because you know, all these other sodium ions are going to repel this net, this new sodium ion we uh, put here. So this takes energy and basically what that means is that there's a potential energy difference between outside the cell and inside the cell. Uh, what the actual number is, again, as we saw on Monday, there are a lot of ions, a lot of charged ions outside and inside on the surface of any given cell. So we, it's hard to keep track of all the individual charges we have. So it's hard to get a measure for just how much potential energy we have stored. But getting a measure of the potential difference or the voltage from one side of the cell or the other is something that we do have. Depending on the type of cell and whether you're talking about you know, a cell like in a body versus in a Petri dish or in the environment of the cell, this number changes. It's not like a constant number. It's anywhere from uh, 30 millivolts to 90 millivolt difference with the inside of the cell being lower than the outside of the cell. That means we have more positive charge outside the cell and more negative uh, negative anions inside the cell. Uh, what our textbook uses is it says that the, uh, it kind of just says that every cell has an average difference in voltage of uh, 70 millivolts, with the inside being 70 millivolts lower, but just kind of keep a, keep a, uh, try to remember that that's kind of an average value. Uh, depending on the cell and the organism, this number can change depending on the conditions of the cell and your general you know, environment inside and outside. But we're going to use a number that there's a 70 millivolt difference. The outside of the cell is at higher potential energy, but we're going to set that as our origin. So we're going to call that zero millivolts. And the inside of the cell is going to be seven millivolts, 70 millivolts lower. So in order to move the ions from one side to another, you guys might remember from intro bio at some point that it takes energy to do that. And that energy comes from 
uh, this process is called active transport. And that energy to kind of push charges essentially uphill here comes from these ATP molecules. So every time we push a charge here, we kind of take energy from ATP and add it into this electrical potential energy of this charge separation on the cell. So it takes energy to do this. And basically our goal for our first problem today, uh, let me go and make this image a bit smaller. So we're gonna consider a typical human cell. And uh, taking kind of numbers, this is from an end of chapter problem in the text. Uh, I believe it is problem 21.6. So yes, 21.6, if you want to see how it is in the text. Uh, but every time this, uh, so we have this charge separation set up on our cell membrane. And this guy here is our, we can say it's a, uh, one of our ion pumps that's doing active transport. I know based on what I said, that it should be the sodium ions moving outside, uh, but the actual animation I did was one of the potassium ions moving. So uh, we're just gonna have to live with that. So we have to think, so every, uh, every second, this pump is able to move 500 ions like that. So it's able to move like 500 positive ions inside and outside. And we want to know how much work that takes. So basically what we're asking is, what is the total, since we know that how many ions are moving and we know the charge on each ion, we want to figure out what the total electrical potential energy is. How much energy did we kind of use in that process? So the total work we're going to need to do to do that is equal to the total change in potential energy. And our total change in potential energy is equal to the charge we move times our change, our delta V, our change in voltage. So, so we wanna figure out how much work we've done to move, to move 500 ions. Each ion is charged once. So they've each lost one electron. So uh, let me one second here. So each ion has a charge, which I'll send you in the chat, of positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So this is the charge for one ion. So let's try to take, let's take this and figure out how much potential energy, how much energy we need to move 500 ions. And then from there, our goal is to figure out how many ATP molecules this takes. Uh, because I, I figure I looked up how much energy you get from breaking up one molecule of ATP, and it's here on the slide. It's 5.1 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. So steps in this problem, find the total charge that we're moving. Then from there, find the total potential energy that we store doing that that's equal to the amount of energy we need to give the system from ATP. From there, we wanna think about if this is the amount of energy in one molecule of ATP, how much energy, how many molecules of ATP do we need to break up and to release the amount of energy? Uh, if you guys can, if you could send me like a some kind of an, of an affirmative that you are working on the problem and uh, kind of know the know the steps. 
that would be great. Or if you have questions, please, please send them. All right, I will then, uh, I will be quiet for two to three minutes or so. And uh, if you have a question along the way, please feel free to ask. Also, if you get a value for the uh, potential energy, uh, then please send that in the chat so people can check with each other. Oh, uh, sorry, question. So, Shun, kind of, the direct, kind of uh, going through this problem, the method here is this, to find the, the total amount of energy we need to move these 500 charges is going to be equal to this. So, we have our delta V, that's the the uh, resting potential of the cell. From here, so this kind of gives us our voltage difference. What we don't know is the total charge we're moving. Uh, but as I said in the, in the chat, we need a value here for the total charge. We know the charge of one ion, so what you need here, this charge Q is the charge of 500 ions. That's how many we're moving. So use this number here, 500 ions, to get the total charge. This information together should give you the way to get the energy. Once you have the energy, guys, just uh, let's compare answers. Actually, let's do charge. So if you have the total charge, send it in the chat. And if you have the total potential energy that we will then need to move those charges, put that in the chat as well. And then we'll, then we'll work on the number of ATP molecules.
And so it looks like, uh, so as far as, uh, this is a good question, a few uh, questions in the chat about is, uh, what is delta V? Is delta V positive or negative? So you compute that delta like you would like a, a change in position. So it's your final potential minus your initial. So our final potential is zero. So delta V is zero minus minus 0 0.7 volts. So these two minuses cancel and our delta V is actually positive. Does that make sense to everyone? So we're moving from low potential energy to high potential energy or lower to higher in absolute terms. So delta V should be a positive number. That's a good question, Will. Trying to draw on the slide with a mouse is my, these numbers look like the scratchings of a madman or a like kindergartner trying to teach a physics class. I hope you guys can, uh, can see what I wrote there. Okay, so looking at the answers that you guys have sent, uh, the charge seems to agree. So I got the same charge that you guys did. 8 times 10 to the minus 17 coulombs. And 5.6 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. This number is positive uh, because delta V is positive. That means we had to add energy into the charge charges as we move them. We're giving them energy to separate them. Negative number there would mean like this process is releasing energy which uh, it isn't, it takes energy to do this. So now we know, we know the total amount of energy in joules that we need to move these 500 charges. Given the information in the problem, how many molecules of ATP will this take? Think about that for a second and think about uh, how we can find that number. So uh, yeah, so seems a few people saying the strategy should be, we wanna divide by the amount of energy in one ATP molecule. And yep, that's what you need to do. That should give you the number of, the number of molecules of ATP that you will need to actually convert to, uh, Yep, getting a lot of uh, confirmation here. So if we do that, here's the total energy we need to move these ions. Here's the energy in one ATP molecule. So the number of ATP molecules we need is around 110 if you're round. Hence the squiggly equal sign. That just means I'm, I'm rounding a bit. So the main reason why I'm I kind of wanted, I think this problem is a good thing to go through. One, because we're going, going to be talking about uh, 
our idea is to build up an understanding of the electrical situation in a cell. But also, I know a lot of you guys that have done uh, a lot of bio courses, I know you've, you've talked a lot about how ATP is the energy source in a cell. That you convert this from, uh, you convert adenosine triphosphate is this molecule that you break up, it releases a lot of energy. It converts to this other molecule called adenosine diphosphate. And then you could kind of keep doing this reaction over and over again to move around energy and uh, et cetera. And so, but I kind of wanted to do this problem so you can get an idea for like, when you're talking about ATP storing energy, it's just storing a certain number of joules. You can uh, synthesize this molecule and do calorimetry and figure out exactly how much energy is released by this reaction. So this is why essentially, this is why it takes energy, why you need active transport to move these potassium or sodium and potassium ions around. It's because you're fighting this electrical field inside the cell membrane. So yeah, I know it's uh, often the way things work in college courses is that looking back on it, you really wish you got things in a different order, but alas, yeah, you're trying to learn so many things at once that uh, you kind of put things together afterwards. But I wanted to do this problem to kind of give you guys, a, try to connect the way you talk about energy in those contexts to the way we're talking about energy here. It's uh, the same way. I mean, you talk, when you say that ATP is the energy of the cell, it means that the reaction this can do releases so many amount of joules, which then gives these molecules enough energy to go from one side of the membrane to another through these ion channels. So there will be uh, one of the home, a few of the homework problems on the next set. I believe you'll have some molecules moving around. Uh, and you will uh, have to kind of convert between voltages and potential energies and charges. So if, when you get to those problems, this should be a good, uh, this problem should be a good uh, model. Uh, I know we're moving a little bit slowly here, but I got, I got one more problem for you guys, which I think will be good to do for the homework. If you want to leave the chat now, if you have to, other things to do, you're more than welcome to, but for those of you that want to stay, we can do the one last problem. So this one is more of a, uh, I guess it's kind of engineering, but it has a medical application. So there's a thing called proton beam therapy. Uh, and this is used kind of a, a type of radiation therapy that's used to treat tumors. So the idea is, is that we take this beam of protons that is sped up uh, to really high speeds and then they're fired at a tumor. Uh, and then when the protons hit the tumor, they deposit all their kinetic energy and it heats up the cells, breaking apart the tumor's DNA and hopefully killing the cancer cells. Uh, and there are ra uh, radiologists and actually a separate like total field of people who work in medicine called medical physicists are the ones that kind of handle these proton beam accelerators for medical purposes. Uh, so here we're given some numbers uh, for, uh, here we have a patient and where we, we want to deposit 0.1 joules of energy into a tumor. And basically the way these things work, at least on a simple way is that a simple accelerator to accelerate protons, you would need some kind of radioactive source to generate free protons. But then you could send them through essentially a capacitor plate with a hole on one side. The protons will start near the positive plate at some high voltage. Here, uh, usually to speed them up quickly enough, you need a, uh, like a voltage of like 25 times 10 to the six volts. So like 25 million volts, it's a huge potential energy difference you need to move them through. So you generate these protons near this high voltage and then they, when they're free, they accelerate to the lower voltage on the, uh, the opposite plate of the capacitor, which we'll call zero for our potential energy origin. And 
So the proton accelerates through this and then leaves the chamber and is fired at the patient's tumor. So what we want to figure out is exactly if we need to deposit, deposit this much energy and our proton moves through this potential difference, what is the speed of the proton after it leaves this? So we need to relate potential energy and kinetic energy here and then find the speed. So that's the first part of the problem. The second part is then to take the total number of protons, figure out how many total number of protons we have to fire to deposit this much energy. So we're going to start here from noticing that our, our change in kinetic energy is going to be equal to our change in potential energy. So potential energy will decrease, kinetic energy will increase by the same amount. So first let's find the change in kinetic energy for one proton and then find how much the speed must have changed. Does that make sense to anyone? Ask any questions if you would like. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be quiet and, and let you guys work for a few minutes. So let's find the total change in kinetic energy first, and then thus how much the speed change. We can assume the proton started at rest over here. So assume its starting speed was zero. If you get the change in kinetic energy here, let's put that in the chat. And then also, if you know the new speed, the final speed of the proton when it reaches this side of the plate. Oh, yes, Jenny, very good question. You do need the mass of the proton for this, uh, which I did not put on the slide. So here, I'll send it to you guys in chat. It's 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Uh, Owen beat me to it. Yeah, so that's in kilograms. And the charge of the proton 
is the same as the charge of the electron, but positive. That's 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. All right, any, uh, any results for the total kinetic energy? We'll need the charge of the proton and delta V. All right, I'll give you guys the uh, next, or at least the next step on the line, just so you guys can check yourself. But we're gonna have a change in kinetic energy. So our one half mass of our proton times V final squared minus one half mass times V initial squared, it's going to be equal to Q times delta V. Uh, I dropped the minus sign from this line to the other, but hopefully you guys can, uh, follow along. Delta V is going to be zero minus 25 times 10 to the six volts. Q will be positive, so the two negative signs should cancel. And our initial speed, oops, sorry, our initial speed is zero, so our initial kinetic energy is zero. From here, this should allow you to, to get to the final speed. So you know all of these quantities, delta V, Q, mass of the proton, and you wanna solve for V final. It'll be a pretty high number. So uh, these protons get moving quite fast. <laughs> 